Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Property Pro Tips, straight from the pros. Today, we have the pleasure of interviewing one John Mansour, partner of Archer Acquisitions in Massachusetts. He manages a $40 million worth of real estate with over 600 units. His early exposure to the real estate industry through his father's construction business influenced him greatly, but family tragedy and personal setbacks, including losing his family's wealth and becoming a ward of the, of the state, shaped his resilience. Transformed by a life-changing experience at Racket Lake Boys, is that, is that right? Racket Lake? Yeah, Racket right. Lake Boys Club camp? He pursued education at Bentley University and later ventured into real estate, focusing on creating sustainable wealth. Despite these challenges, his commitment to prioritizing investment returns has led to significant achievements in acquiring RV parks and multifamily properties. Welcome, John. Glad to have you on, man. Thanks so much for having me, Trevor. Really appreciate it. First question, what happened to Ra Racket Lake Boys Club Camp, if, you, if you're willing to talk about it? Well, what was that life-changing piece? Oh, yeah. So pretty much at the time prior to, I guess, being awarded a scholarship to Racket Lake, which is in the Adirondack Mountains of New York, you know, I was living with friends and family for I probably moved about 22 times or 15 wow. times between the between sixth grade and ninth grade. You know, I was awarded a scholarship to the sleepaway camp. And there's articles from New York Times that this camp should have like golden canoes. And it's just a very high quality kids camp. And so pretty much I went there. Mm -hmm. I met with, you know, some I had some really cherished memories. It was the best time of my life because it allowed me to get out of the traumatic events that were going on at home because I'd be there for seven to eight weeks and I would just be a kid. You know, I wasn't I was focused on going to uh, court cases for family custody. I wasn't mm -hmm. being interviewed by uh, child protect services. I wasn't, you know, moving from place to place to stay with a friend's family for two months and so on and so forth. So it gave me one of the best childhood memories that has molded me kind of into the individual I am today. And at that sleepaway camp, one of the directors of the camp actually became a like a legal mentor, went through like six to nine months of background checks. You know, he became a mentor of mine. And then in high school, he actually took me in. I really wanted to get into finance and investment banking. But, you know, he mentioned to me that like, the harsh reality is no one really cares about your background and no one cares what happened to you. You have to produce results and actually succeed. Sure, it's a, it's a cool story, but it's a situation where you're not going to be handed things in your life constantly. You know, I was blessed because a lot of people actually helped me out when I was a kid, um, you know, by giving me sneakers when my sneakers were too small on my feet or clothes on my back and so on and so forth. But the harsh reality is, you know, once you turn 18 and you're an adult, that all kind of goes away and you have to actually fend for yourself and produce. I mean, it looks like you've done a very good job of that, sir. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I try. I try. The, the job's not done yet. Yeah, well, it's never done. Trust me. Yeah. We are child. We are learners until we die, at least in my in my perspective and how in my experience. So. Your attitude is amazing, John. Thank you for being on our show. Right, so uh, let's get started. So how did you first know you wanted to be in real estate? Let's start, let's start from the beginning. Great question. So right when I was, actually, I tried getting my real estate license when I was in college, but I didn't have enough time, the dues from the brokerage fees and so on and so forth. I just didn't want to do that. Uh, I couldn't afford it and so on and so forth. It was just the harsh reality. But after graduating Bentley, I stumbled into real estate consulting. And so I was doing real estate consulting in New York City, but I didn't understand ball control or contract control or any kind of control or contract law. And I thought everyone was go happy, go lucky. You know, we're going to do a deal here and there where everyone's going to make money. Everyone's going to shake hands and walk away. No, it's a cutthroat industry. You're going to get cut out of deals. You're going to get burned. Your People are greedy. They're in it for the money and not really to like have everyone kind of grow together. And so I loved real estate. You know, my dad was an interior designer and general contractor when I was younger. So I would see him flip and turn these houses in Greenwich, Connecticut from something that's not so pretty into this magnificent property. 
And so I always was fascinated with the process there. But then I kind of refound that love for real estate, doing kind of real estate consulting and while working like a nine to five job. To be honest, I didn't make any money during those two years I was doing it. Didn't do a single deal, didn't earn anything because I had like no guidance or I was trying to do in New York City where it was extremely cutthroat. What ended up happening was the pandemic. At the time, I was doing cybersecurity consulting. What ends up happening is our salaries get cut 50% because when I was working at 9 to 5, yeah, 50%. 50%. Yeah. Wow. And I was and I was living in New York City. And as we all know, New York City is very expensive. But what ended up happening was I was just like, I'm just going to leave New York before it was like, before everything got shut down. So I left New York, moved to Florida. And then from there, I was traveling up and down the Eastern seaboard, kind of trying to figure out what I wanted to do next while also working remotely. And then, you know, while I was moving up and down the Eastern seaboard, I got furloughed. And at the time, unemployment, the benefits were, you know, decent. And so pretty much I was just trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I want to kind of do the entrepreneurial journey. And then my brother gave me a call. He was living in North Carolina. He ran a general contracting company. He had like a restaurant, no, a bar that we converted into a restaurant. And so I was helping with that process. But during that entire time, I was still trying to figure out what I wanted to do. What ended up happening was him and I actually started renovating or we decided that we wanted to do a cross-country trip. So we renovated a 1979 Winnebago and 1979 yeah, Winnebago. That, yeah, that's an old Winnebago, man. <laughs> it was a very unique story. We found it in like the backwoods of like green, was it Greensboro, New, uh, North Carolina, but some the like, backwoods. yeah, backwoods, sorry. Backwoods of like Greenboro, uh, North Carolina at this like, you know, guy's house that had like, cars junk cars all on his driveway and he sold it to us for five hundred dollars and a win (laughs) there were there were i think there were two bullet holes in it which were fascinating and then he told us his entire outlandish story so we got up and running uh, was the story about the bullet holes (laughs) yeah the story was about the bullet holes right i i don't don't want to go into that you know (laughs) don't need to i'm just just clarify make sure i heard you right (laughs) um but he allowed us to like, kind of like keep it there for a little bit while we like cleaned it off, got it up and running. Cause I hadn't been started in, I think five years. So we siphoned the gas, we put new gas in, we replaced a couple of filters, call it a day. But this was like a major, there was a major carburetor engine, like kind of like in the middle of the two like driver seats. We started renovating it. And then a buddy of mine from Bentley actually reached out to me. His name is Ben, uh, who's my, now my business partner, but he was doing real estate leasing in boston and then also he was trying to he was learning more about real estate wholesaling and so what ended up happening was we stayed in contact everything was going great and we started driving this rv across the country i kid you not we blew up two times we broke down 17 times in a matter of four days i stayed in nashville for like five days waiting for a couple parts we had a police escort because we can only go 25 miles an hour on an interstate there was just a whole array of stories but that i kind of rediscovered my love of camping and uh camping. you know we were we were yeah. broken down at the top of the rocky mountains and you know i slept under the stars it was absolutely magnificent you know Sounds but then amazing. yeah so then i ended up moving to florida ben had started doing the real estate wholesaling and he was actually getting really good at it so him and i started working together one thing led to another i was working with him one thing led to another. I asked, how do I become a partner? And one thing led to another. He's like, you got to come to Boston. I slept on, you know, his couch, his parents' couch. And then I had a couple of buddies who I slept on their couch, just trying to make it all work. Because at the time I wasn't making any money. I didn't have a job, so I couldn't get a lease. So I had a really good uh, network of people that allowed me to, they helped me along my journey. And I wouldn't be sitting here today without them. And then we started wholesaling. Then we transitioned to buying properties. Started with single family in December of 2021 that we used for Airbnb. And since then, you know, we've grown to about $40 million worth of assets. And we have about $25 million that we're closing on in the next four to 12 weeks. 
that's the prolonged story, you know? Fantastic. St that's a fantastic story, John. I mean, from camper straight one level from homeless to $40 million in asset management in three years, four years, like two and a half. Yes. <laughs> two and a half. That, that's a record. <laughs> Hear that ladies and gentlemen, two and a half years it takes to, to be a real estate mogul. That's, that's half of what it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic. So, so just to expound a little bit about on that, John, where's your brother now? Is he still a partner? Is he, is he working with you? Oh, yeah, no, my brother's not working with me. He actually, so I made it halfway across the country and he took it all the way to California. To be in honest, the RV? I no, yeah, in the RV. So like after we got <laughs> through Tennessee, everything kind of went downhill from there. No, not downhill, uphill from there. Just depends on the way you look at uphill, downhill, but everything got so much smoother. And so no more breakdowns, nothing happened. But before then I was in a bad car accident. I had to go to, to go down to Florida for some health reasons, but, but yeah, now he's in, he's in California. He's a real estate broker in Los Angeles and he's absolutely crushing it. He runs a company called hit realty. If anyone in, is in LA, just look him up. Great guy. Hit real John. Maybe, maybe he wants to be uh, interviewed on the podcast after his bro. Oh, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I think it could be cool. Mm -hmm. Love to meet him. So you mentioned your first deal a little bit in your, in your, how you got started. But, uh, if you could, could you expound upon like, what was your first deal and how did that, how did that come about? And what, what was the end result? It was really interesting. So from the beginning, we've never actually used any of our own money. We raised from, you know, passive investors that see the value of real estate, but just don't know what they want to do. So we're really blessed that a lot of people actually took risks with us, but we were able to return some pretty good returns. But the first deal that we did was a single family that used to be a duplex in a town called North Adams, Massachusetts. We bought it for like a hundred thousand dollars. Wow. I think we put it in roughly somewhere between, I think it was like 80 grand that we put into it of all renovations. And now we use it for Airbnb. It's five bed, two bath sleeps 12, has a hot tub. It's actually doing pretty well. But the money that we raised was from, you know, like three of our buddies that want to earn a nice return. We gave them like a 13% annualized return, returned everything within like a 12 to 18 month period with all their interest. Wow. I think the property appraised at like 350 or like 325 after we were done with it. So wow. three all in all, it was a pretty good deal, but- hey, Congratulations. Yeah, I appreciate that. The thing is, we realized that we like Airbnb because we like the creating the entire experience. But we also realized that like we want to do something that's a little bit simpler. So we went, so we started doing multi. So we bought a three unit here, an eight unit here, a five unit here, and then just slowly scaled that up. Yeah, it was a, honestly a great time. There were a lot of headaches though for the for the first deal. Sorry, I totally forgot about this. So uh, the one thing is with anyone investing in the Northeast or anyone investing anywhere in Northern States, you know, it gets really cold. There was one time I was coming back up from New York. We were, we were still, you know, furnishing, doing some renovations. So I went to go uh, stay at the, stay at the property to help out with a few things. No one was there. And so we had, I don't actually, it was like a, it was a furnace, but it has like a, it has like an automate automatic system where, cause it's, hot it's forced hot water but pretty much it wasn't working and it was like the middle of winter cool, like a swamp cooler in reverse for heat i would say like no it the pretty much the furnace wasn't getting what it needed to get to heat the house mm. and so it just yeah there's the specific turn i just i'm not i'm blanking on it so i apologize but uh no, no what problem. ended up happening was we don't uh, have those in california so i'm curious that's all yeah <laughs> so i get there and the house is freezing Everything was frozen. Everything was. And the thing is, my not very smart self at the time, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to sleep in the house and just say whatever. It's like, you know. I could do this. Mental fortitude, you know. But and I, I woke up in the middle of the night. I was like, I, I had to go sleep in my car because there was no hotels that were open in the area and so on and so forth. So what ends up happening the next day. Everything kind of thaws out. We get a plumber out there and pipes were leaking everywhere in the everywhere mostly in the basement and like 
I would say the bathrooms. But thankfully, it wasn't like anything too detrimental that it would have destroyed the deal. But I will say, first deal, it not going that well for that aspect of it was fine. You know, it's just whatever. It's it's things come up. So yeah, so that would say that that's the only headache with 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 that deal. <laughs> That's a that that's a great so see, and that's awesome because you get in perspective from the East Coast. We here in California we have you know earthquakes to worry about. Yeah. <laughs> but we don't have to worry about you know what was Freezing this thing pipes. that came to like the polar vortex that came through a couple of years ago and for things that are <laughs> rising down. <laughs> it's just different headaches, different places. It's all, yeah. all kind of evens out. <laughs> well, question in regards to your first deal. I wanted to bring just back back to it, because it's a question I get asked a lot. You mentioned that you bought your first deal with OPM, other people's money, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that raise, how did you go about asking those first set of investors for money when you've never done it before and had, did not have a track record? Because that's a big question that everyone's like, how do I raise money when I've never raised money? Yeah, I would say like, it just had like, so like the three, I think we raised, you know, I think we raised like 80K from like three people or something like that. Or it was like 50. I'm not, I don't remember exactly. It was a while ago, but pretty much all of them were doing some sort of passive real estate investing in the past. Mm. And we had uh -huh. a, they knew what we were doing with wholesaling because prior to actually getting into acquiring properties, we were doing very well in wholesaling. I think we did close to a million or a million two in wholesale uh, fees within the two years prior to our first acquisition. So would you mind to just for the sake of the audience, who, for those who might not know what wholesaling is, what just tell us a little bit about what the, exactly that is. Oh yeah. So wholesaling is pretty much you're acting as if you're purchasing the property, you put it under agreement and then you flip that contract or you find a person that actually wants to take on the project and you sell it to them for a higher price and you make the, the, the Delta or the spread between what you have it under contract for and what they're paying you for. So if it's 200,000, you have it under agreement and then you sell it someone for 220, you make 20 grand. Of course, everyone says that you need little to no money. And actually that's not true. You need to do EMD money. You actually need a good contract and so on and so forth. So you don't get screwed over, but you can easily get into it without needing a real estate license, which is why a lot of people do it. And you control your income more rather than having to hang up your license with a brokerage. Thank you for the explanation. That's different approach than uh, I've I've heard. I'm not sure if it's a legal thing with Cal between California and Massachusetts, but that, that's that's something very cool. I mean, I've I've actually never heard of wholesaling being being explained that way from my California brokers or anything. That's so uh, that's that that's very cool. So that yeah. that dovetailed into the, your first deal is how I understand it, correct? Yeah. So pretty much like all of those individuals, you know, one of them, a few of them were probably act more active investors that were doing flips. And they just wanted to give us an opportunity. And we gave them, I would say, pretty good preferred returns, but we weren't giving them any kind of equity. And they wanted it to be more, they want it to be more of a debt investment than an equity investment because they don't actually know what's going to happen on the back end. They just want their return and to get out, which is fine. And we were able to do it. We had to fight, you know, we had to argue with a, an appraiser because they tried coming back at the appraisal of like what we purchased it at, which didn't make sense because there were clear comps. It's, I don't know, appraisers, don't get me started, but I love them at the same time, you know? But yeah, so it was it was a good deal. From there, there mm -hmm. is one of the most interesting things I saw in your um, bio was the the RV space. What? How did you make the decision to go into RV, what, park owning? Does it RV parks? Yeah, like, like, RV parks. I'm thinking? Yeah, well, yeah. How did that come about? And like, tell me about that. <laughs> yeah, so it was it was pretty unique at the time. I was so during this entire process, I was still like living living in my business partner's family's farm in like northern Massachusetts, northern central northern Massachusetts. And you know, Ben would constantly ride his like mountain bike or bike through <laughs> rail trails. He came across his RV park. He went he went up to the the store and was like, what is this place? Because, you know, we didn't know RV parks. We thought we only we've only noticed mobile home parks. So he thought it was a mobile home park, but it wasn't because the the structures looked different. And they were like, this is X, Y and Z RV park. It's been in our family for like 40 or 50 years. And as a real estate investor, he was just like, would you guys ever sell? 
And they said, no, you're trying to steal a property from me. It's a cash cow. You know you want to steal it from me. I'll never sell. Um, and just it just piqued our interest that they said cash cow and that they'll never sell. And it's been in the family for 40 years. What makes it so interesting to actually want to hold on to something like this for that long of time? And so we started doing some cold calling, stumbled into this park in southern New Hampshire. The owners were like, yeah, we'd be interested in selling. So if you actually come by uh, so we know you're real, we'd be happy to talk to you about it. So he drove over there that day. What ends up happening was they had a good conversation. They meticulously ran the park. So it was more like a turnkey business and turnkey asset with like some tired parts. Like, you know, the roads weren't paved. The greenery was overgrown. You know, the um, some of the amenities are just kind of tired. And they just need a little bit of love. So, and the deal had a little bit of hair on it. So what ends up happening was they want to sell for a reasonable price. We want to buy it, but we've never run a campground. And the, I guess, co-sponsor that we were working with has never bought a campground. So we were like, what do we do? And how do we create a sense of ease for our investors? What ends up happening is me and my other business partner, Carl, since, you know, at the time I'm technically homeless while still, you know, buying real estate, uh, we that's actually, okay. yeah, <laughs> we actually, we actually decided to move into the RV park. And move so, it. It, yeah, it came with, it came with like a single family house slash office. So we actually moved into the RV park to run it. Yes. To, and so we took, I we got it. the management contract and so on and so forth, but we did everything. We did the, the maintenance, we did the landscaping, we did the plowing, we did the guest interaction. There's so many more nuances with RV parks and there are a mobile home park or a, or a multifamily or office space or retail, but it was super exciting because, you know, you were in this really unique environment, but also you were surrounded by nature. And so we ran the campground our first year if my memory serves me right, you know, we took it from like a gross of like 420,000 to a gross of 740,000 year one. Yeah. Our NRI went from full, uh, 150 to 330. It cash flowed about 150 grand, even though we were using floating rate interest and we got to 14 and a half percent on that note. Oh, <laughs> wow. Did you buy it with a credit card? I <laughs> should have, you know? <laughs> At least I already got ca cash back. <laughs> that is awesome. Great work. That, what were the two things you did to value add an RV park that made you, that you're able to obviously increase the revenue on? Of course. And, and so uh, like we, so like I would say the first thing that we did was kind of twofold. We increased the capacity for winter camping. You would never believe there's actually a lot of demand for winter camping in the Northeast. Yes, you have a lot of traveling contractors, really? you have a lot of traveling nurses. So the campground had, you know, like 20 winter capable spots. What ended up happening was we increased it to like 29. And, you know, that nine at $6,000 a season for the winter, you know, that's, what is that, like uh, $54,000 of top line and at a 50% yeah. expense ratio, you're adding $250,000 of value at a 10 cap, give or take if my math serves me right. And, but the thing is we couldn't add more winter capacity by adding in the actual infrastructure, the correct infrastructure. So we created this like water delivery system. Water so we take, delivery system. Yeah. So we, we have this word delivery system where we actually uh, go around with like a water truck and fill up each RV so you have people calling in saying, I need a spot. I don't really care what is on it. As long as I have electricity and I can dump my, my, my septic or sewage. And we're like, well, there's not like a water hookup, but we will fill up your camper every, like every other day. And so we did that and we took it from 29 to like 44 people or 40 people. And it absolutely popped. The second thing is literally just landscaping, good landscaping, making the park pretty during the spring and the summer and making sure that people were, it's, it's like, I would say those would be like the two things, beautifying the park and also just increasing, increasing the, the amount of sites that we had available during the winter. And of course, increasing the rates, but those were like, I would say those are the two biggest things: landscaping 
and adding more winter capable spots. Outstanding. That is a, I've never heard of a uh, RV park value add play. And do, yeah. you, do you still own the asset? Yeah, we still own it. We refinanced all the investors cash out within, I would say like, I think it was like 14 months, not all of it. Sorry. Like 70% of the investors money out with like a Yeah. <laughs> we just were really happy to get off of the floating rate interest because we would have been, I would have been at like 18% today or something like that. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And, and how does an RV park, because I know you're diversified that you do, it was the RV park. Are you looking for more to RV parks to, to purchase? Would you consider continue on with that business plan? Does it complement your investment strategy or was it just kind of a one-off? And Oh, we own five. So we own five RV parks now about, I think it's like 516 pads. So we bought two our first year. So one, me and my business partner, Carl, we actually managed on site. The second one was like a 45 minute drive and we had on site managers there. And so it, it taught us how to actually like operate a park with not, without one of us actually being at on site and manage the employees remotely. And then from there, we created the correct SOPs, create the rest, the correct processes, pretty much doing everything in house. So then when we bought the other three recently, we bought those at the end of January and those, you know, now we have on-site, on-site managers, on-site staff, though I would say one of the biggest challenges is making sure that the, the reservation software is that their updates don't screw you over because sometimes the updates that they do, you know, it messes with invoicing and invoicing is huge. It's very important because if you, if you can't invoice, then you're chasing, let's say if you have a 200 pad RV park, you're chasing 200 people to pay you when you can just send them an invoice and they can pay it at their own pace. So the invoicing software is one of your biggest challenges with RV park management. I, it's not like a major challenge. It's a relative challenge. If they do any kind of updates and they release a new version of the software and then those bugs of that update don't screw you over because sometimes they do wow. and then it takes a while for them to fix it. Yeah, but the I would say the biggest challenge is just really making sure that you're creating a great overall experience for, you know, your, your guest because it's, because if you think about it, it's a, it's a hospitality play, but you also are serving so many other types of guests and other needs. Some people may be just traveling contractors and traveling nurses, and they just need like a nice, quiet, clean place to stay. Other people are looking for more an affordable uh, vacation rather than going to, you know, Costa Rica and spending five grand for the family vacation for seven days or six days when they can spend five to six grand for the entire summer. Now, do you have RVs permanently parked at these parks that you could rent, just rent the RV and a family can come stay in it? Or do, are they actually driving on and driving off? Of most of our parks, they're driving on and driving off right now. We haven't really implemented that many cabins or yurts or tiny houses, but one of the campgrounds that we just purchased in, outside of Hartford, Connecticut, that has a year, a cabin, and then one in New Hampshire that we just purchased also has a cabin. So we're gonna we're kind of playing with it a little bit, but it's not like we haven't done any like really cool glamping scenarios yet where we're you know spending two hundred thousand dollars on the setup because we have to make sure that the ROI is there and that we actually want to have people. And to answer your other question about like are people like staying at the camp permanently the one thing is like it's a little bit of a gray area but you can't have people stay there because they can't claim residency so there has Mm -hmm. to like you have to make sure that you're moving people around within the park or that you're making them sign these these contracts for like the seasonal let's say if you want to be there if you were a traveling contractor and you need to somewhere to be you need to be somewhere for a year Mm -hmm. you do two seasonal contracts one in the summer and one in the winter. The contract is really like a permit or a license to use the land that you can ro- revoke at any time. And you need to make sure that you establish like a good relationship with the poli- with like the town's police department. Because if those people are causing a ruckus, they're not paying and they're just breaking all the rules, then you can technically kick them out within like a 30 minute period. And let's say if they get become a little bit hostile, hostile minute. Yeah. 30 30 minutes. minutes. Yeah. 30 minutes. Whoa. 
actually less. It just really depends on how long it that's takes to like, set up. Yeah. <laughs> so like if you have someone that's staying there like longer term, technically like people that are multifamily in Northeast or in California or more liberal, like blue States, they, the evict, as we know, the eviction process is very cumbersome. If you have someone that's like a retiree and living in their RV full time, and they're like moving from our RV park to RV park, there's no eviction process because they're technically not, they're, they're not residents. You just call guests. the cops. Yeah. You just call the police and say they're trespassing. And exactly. It sounds like heaven from yeah. the guy in California <laughs> <laughs> who, who oh, yeah. takes four or five months to evict somebody who's done something wrong. Or yeah, not exactly. paid the rent. Can't see I'm not a little bit jealous. But <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, John, what is your, portfolio look like today and what strategies did you implement to achieve where you are now coming from yeah. RV park number one? So to answer your, the second question first, um, how we kind of grew to where we are, you know, being in the wholesaling business, we met with a lot of operators in the areas that we are. And so they are older, they have a better network, you know, they've, they've done more deals than us. So what we've done was we've actually leveraged our relationship with those operators and those investors. And so, you know, when we first started, when we were actually co-sponsoring on deals, we did all the work. But what we did was and we would bring the we would bring the deal that met a specific sponsor's buy box. And we told them like, hey, we want to, we want to operate the deal with you. We want to be a co-sponsor. We'll do everything, but we don't raise money. And because at the time we didn't have an investor network, we never established it. We didn't have the, the, the you know a track record, and they're like, okay. And so we we had our we negotiated our split with that co sponsor. We went off to races. We found you know two or three co sponsors that we really liked working with, and just put more fuel on the fire, and we grew to you know forty million and. We're managing a lot of our stuff. And then sometimes the co-sponsors want to manage the actual property because, you know, it's their investors and so on and so forth. But but that I would say that's a strategy that we use to kind of catapult ourselves. Now, what our portfolio looks like, I would say m- most of like the value is heavily focused on multifamily. So I would say about 30 million in multifamily and like 10 to 12, eh, 10 to 12 million uh, RV parks, but now we're, you know, we're slowly growing them both and we have like the systems in place and we're just backfilling a lot of the geographic areas that we're currently operating in with more units. And then RV parks, we're just, we're trying to stay within like a three to a five hour drive from where any one of us is so that if anything major comes up at the parks, we can actually go to it ourselves. I'm a big believer in keeping it local drivable at least i, oh, I keep yeah. mine to like a 20 minute drive because it's la that's that could be <laughs> like three hours 30 minutes means it, yeah <laughs> 20 minute drive with no traffic it means it could be a two hour drive with traffic so you gotta get yeah, exactly. minutes. <laughs> <laughs> being successful as you are john what advice would you give to young entrepreneurs who would aspire to do what you're doing or similar i would say like if you know someone, like if you are an individual that's looking to get into wholesaling or are looking to get into syndicating or raising money and you, I would say you don't really have skills or you haven't, you haven't, you haven't figured out what you like and what you don't like. I would try to figure out who is, who's doing well in the space and who's open to actually like, like buy them a cup of coffee, buy them lunch. Most of the time they'll end up paying for your lunch because they'll just be like, well, I like that you gave it a, you know, a shot, like an, like the thought, like pay for me, but I'll pay for your lunch and so on and so forth. And then, you know, just do what people used to do and just say, I'll work for you for free for like four or five days to see if I like it. And then maybe do like an internship or work part time, try to figure it out. You know, as, as you were mentioning before, there's so many YouTube videos that are out there that people can easily find. I would it easily finds like figure out what they want to do. And then also you just got to start if you're, if you're doing, if you want to be in real estate, you just got to start doing deals. Like you have to start cold calling, you have to start door knocking, you have to start driving for dollars or biking for dollars. If you don't have a car, like you just need to start doing it and failing utterly 
if you just keep failing, you're going to grow. And if you stick with it and you'll, you'll probably, you'll start succeeding within the first, I would say three to six months, possibly maybe 12. Straight from John Mansorg, everybody <laughs> fail until you make it not fake it, fail it. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the dang exact truth when it comes to real estate and anything in life, in my opinion. <laughs> no, yeah, I agree with you 100%. Fail faster, I, fail better. The failure in real estate is what, think drives real estate is i think that's what i feel like you're saying right mm -hmm. yeah but if but if like you're raising money like i i don't know i just always make sure that you're like completely transparent with any investors and the one thing that we do to like align incentives is that we operate like a low fee syndication model low fee syndication model right? tell yeah, me more about that yeah because syndicators work? they charge acquisition fees they charge disposition fee refinance fees asset management fees and a bunch of other fees here and there marketing fees loan guarantor we only charge a two percent acquisition fee and that's it we don't charge an asset management fee we don't charge a dispo fee a refinance fee loan guarantor fee none of those because the only time that that we really make money and most syndicators make money is on the back end if you have all those fees baked in you can pretty much guarantee the success of the, the syndicator can guarantee their success and not guarantee the success of the, L, the LP. So if they can somehow find a deal that's, you know, not, not the best and sell it to the investor and they have all these fees baked in, then they know that they're going to, that the, the syndicator knows that they're going to make money, but you know, who knows about the LP? It's just like, I think there's like a weird, not a weird, but like, it's like a, interesting like space you need to make sure you have aligned incentives and if you don't you have to somehow figure out what you need to do to create that aligned incentives like you need to make sure you're giving your investors good deals 100 percent, especially when you're starting out right because you don't have a track record so you're gonna have to offer more than the next indicator who's been doing it for a while yeah yeah i but like also when you get into like the institutional level space as well i think that like i don't know i Personally, to me, like the ins like the institutional level deals, like we've looked at, I just for like I don't know, maybe I'm too conservative, but like I somehow can't make those any of the deals that I've looked at in like the the fifty to one hundred million dollar range. I can't I can't make any of them work whatsoever. And I would say like stick to what you know. If like if you've done leasing before, if you lived in apartment buildings, like you know what you would want as a tenant. And if you've done camping or if you've done any kind of RVing or glamping, then try to do something in that space because you actually have like a legitimate passion for it in your outside life, personal life. Fantastic insight, John. Uh, tying in what you like and love to what you're actually doing because you're right. Mm -hmm. Living in an apartment building, that's a, that's a very good prerequisite to owning apartment buildings. Just yeah. kind of like living in a house. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> I've never heard it said that way, but that's a very succinct way of explaining like your first experience with apartments, right? First yeah, exactly. experience with apartment buildings is living in one. Yeah. And and it's also like the same for retail. It's just, I wouldn't mm -hmm. say I probably dental offices, not really or medical offices, but there's a huge demand for them and everyone needs to go there. It's just like whatever. But like retail, like for instance, like you know, as like, like, let's say if you like to go to a lot of brick and mortar locations and you want, let's say if you want to go to a smoothie place, or if you want to go to a coffee shop, you want to make sure that as an operator, that you're putting people in your uh, retail plazas that you would actually go to. And mm -hmm. you want to make sure it's like, it's in a location that you would like, if it's somewhere that like, that you would never go to, then why would you be buying it? You know, you would be, it probably the returns look great. But like, if you honestly, if you won't use any of your product that you're selling to investors, then don't sell it to investors. Don't sell it. Yeah. If you wouldn't buy it, don't sell it, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 100%. All right. La last question, John. And this is always about our, 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 this is our future forecasting. We'll bring out our crystal, crystal balls. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what, <laughs> what trends do you see happening in the future in the real estate market? And I know that's a loaded question. That's a great question. So pretty much I've, you know, I've spoken to a, a bunch of operators and investors that everyone has their different idea of like where the interest rate market's going. Cause that's, the, that's the biggest question, you know, where is the interest rate market going to be in the next 12 months? Where's it going to be in the fall? To be honest, 
you know, I've I've heard people say in the beginning of the year, people were saying that there's gonna be like five or six rate cuts, everything's gonna go down to four percent, the economy's gonna boom, yada yada yada. I really think what's gonna end up happening is that we're gonna be at, at a at stagnant place for the next 12 to 24 months. Maybe prior to the election, you'll see like one rate cut, but you're not really gonna see like a major shift in where the rates are today versus you know six to 12 months from now. And I do believe that for us personally, you know, we're looking like we're in the process of starting a fund for RV parks because we see that there's right now a lot of institutional level chit chat going on regarding RV parks. And so what we're doing is we want to, and we've been approached by a couple of private equity shops to fund us. They just, they didn't get, they didn't offer good enough splits for us. And so we're raising this fund and what we're doing is, you know, we're going to roll up RV parks that are, you know, you know, one to $5 million. And we're going to then in a seven to 10 year horizon, probably sell it to one of them at a nice premium. And, you know, it's, we really like RV parks. We really like operating them. Personally, I would, I would want to like, we want to buy a couple for ourselves after we kind of do our uh, exit and yeah, man, just continue to have RV parks in our portfolio or do some kind of glamping. So the two things, I think interest rates are going to stay stagnant. We're going to see like a 25 basis point cut. And then you're going to see a lot more institutional level investments into the RV park space because it's still untapped. <laughs> well, thank you, John. That's an amazing insight on the, into the RV park world. That, uh, I, can't, I'm, I wonder if it's akin to... Uh, what it compares to like public storage and like mobile home park management. I know they're all different, but those are like the niche, niche, niche real estate corners of real estate that are uh, very interesting. I would say that we are where self storage was 20 years ago, 10 oh, years wow. ago before it got very sexy. Like it became an extremely mm -hmm. sexy topic, but now I think they're overbuilding self storage. And I think the people that are going to make, I think what's going to end up happening, you're going to see, prices like self-storage rents drop, you're going to see occupancies drop, and then uh, you'll probably end up seeing what they used to be. I think occupancy, the historical occupancy for self-storage, again, I'm not a self-storage operator, so I may be totally out of whack here, but I think the average occupancy prior to the pandemic was like 90%. So there's like a 10% vacancy. And during the, during the pandemic, there was like a 2% vacancy. So like yeah. people were selling or like a two to 4% vacancy and they were, they were, people were trying to buy these things at like ridiculously low cap rates. I just think it's, it's the cap rate compression because of the institutional level demand mm -hmm. came in. And so now it's really hard to make like a really good self storage. Like when, before institutions came in, the self, self storage returns were probably, you're probably buying these things at like a 12 cap, you know? Wow. But now you're buying them at like a six to an eight, maybe less. Wow. Wow. Congratulations, John. You guys are doing it right. I, I appreciate I, it. I'm excited to see how you're, what the future holds for you, my friend. You got a long career in front of you. On to my favorite part of the show. <laughs> the last <laughs> little bit. The lightning round real estate questions. <laughs> Not exactly real estate related. Yep. I'm just going to ask you the question and be quiet. You talk as long or as little as you like, and we'll go right on to the next question and we'll call it a wrap. All right. Can you share one non-negotiable part of your morning routine with us? Oh, that's tough. You know, well, the one thing I've, I've recently started doing, which I wish I've been doing, I was doing for a lot longer, just going outside for at least like 10 minutes. You know, I think it's like, it's extremely important because like I used to be the type of person that rolls out of bed and then just starts getting to work and pretty much roll out of bed, do my you know morning routine or whatever, but it wasn't really anything special, you know, brush my teeth, take a shower, blah, blah. But now it's more like focused on, I guess, personal and mental health, where I think it's very important to I don't know, be a little bit more, be out, be outside a little bit more and really kind of take in the day. Because as you know, and I know, you know, what we're in, in the space that we're in, sometimes you'll be, you'll be in front of your computer on meetings or on calls pretty much the entire day. And next thing you know, you know, you start working at like eight, nine o'clock in the morning, it's 7 p.m. and you didn't get any kind of sunlight and like you feel like kind of like out of whack. 
but yeah, going outside at least once in the morning. <laughs> Love it. Sunlight can save you. What's one app or piece of technology you can't live without? Honestly, I wish I, I wish I didn't have like the need to like aim sometimes aimlessly scroll on like Instagram reels or like Facebook reels or whatever there. I want to say there's not, well, Excel spreadsheets that I can't live without. I need those. I love them. Whenever my business partners call me and they, they want to like, they want to like to like, Oh, can you like, what are your thoughts on this? I'm like, let me just model it out. Like one time, like we modeled out running a tortilla business, it was just making like homemade tortillas and selling them. It's just, we just, we went down the rabbit hole, but yeah, Excel, <laughs> I can't live without. What book has significantly impacted your life or mindset? Honestly, I don't have a book that that's really impacted my mindset. I know there's like Rich Dad, Poor Dad, How to Win, Win Friends and Influence People and Chris Voss, Never Split the Difference. I haven't found like a book that's like, wow, to me, um, which is unfortunate, unfortunate, but I wish I had have. But uh, but yeah, there. I want to say there's there, there's one book that's that's like wowed me or made me maybe I sound like a too harsh of a critic, but like I plus you know, that's something I don't really do a lot. I don't really read a lot, which I want to get into, but yeah, I just, I haven't made time. No judgment. <laughs> <laughs> what is the one thing at the top of your bucket list? I really want to go, I want to go coral diving or, or swimming with sharks on some coral reefs, not on them, but like, you know, swim around them because there's like so much biodiversity. There's so much diversity there. I want to, I, I want to go swim with sharks off the coast of South Africa. I would say that there. That's a, that's a good bucket list. Okay, great. If you could have dinner with any person, living or dead, who would it be and why? I'd want to uh, have dinner with uh, Jordan Belfort. Jordan Belfort. You know, the Wolf of Wall Street. Because honestly, his his tactics to sales and just like kind of like reading the room and negotiating, I just, honestly, I would just love to just kind of like understand i want to i want to know like more of like the raw story of when he was younger but also like how he's like how he's navigating the world now and uh doing everything that he's doing i i just really would love to meet the guy he seems like a awesome individual and i would love to do the scene from the the movie where they go mm -hmm. uh, actually uh, uh, is that mcconaughey <laughs> doing that yeah <laughs> Like a four martini lunch is that we exactly <laughs> <laughs> bring one every 13 seconds so i'm on the floor that's so funny man the last question i will let you go sir <laughs> <laughs> it, uh do you have a motto or saying that guides your life decisions and what is it i'd say it is what it is you know is sometimes because there's a lot of people that stress about things that they can't control. Whenever there's something happening that's like, it's like totally out of my control. You know, whenever I'm feeling stressed, I write down everything I'm stressed about and just kind of cross out the stuff I can't control. I saw this on some kind of social media platform that someone did this and I started doing it. And wow, it, it helps me so much because you just feel overwhelmed by everything that you have to do. But there are, when there are, it's like 90% of the things that you're stressed about, you can't control. So why let it impact your life and put you in like a, put you in like a corner and make you feel like, like nervous and scared and so on and so forth. It is what it is. Awesome tip. Just so I, everyone heard it. I want to repeat it. Cause it's a, I re, I'm always trying to make convince myself of this myself <laughs> is <laughs> if you can't control it, you have to let it go. Right. Yeah, you make it a list of all the things that you're worrying about, and you're saying cross off the ones you can't do anything about because there's a lot of things are most things are yeah. truly out of our control, and worrying about them will do zero things besides a just make us lose some hair and, and give us <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, John. Well, that is our show, man. Thank you for being on and we'll call that a wrap. <laughs>